This has been going on for a long time, and I think a lot of people here may not have heard of the case, may not have heard of the joke. Um, would you be able to explain what the joke was about, what the premise of the joke was? OK, uh, this is a joke I did uh, from 2010 to 2013 about there was a little boy uh, here in the province of Quebec in Canada who was a famous singer. He was a disabled singer and um, he became famous. He wasn't a very good singer, but he was uh, he, beca he it was almost like a make, make a wish foundation kid. And he had sang for the Pope, and it was very cute. And he was portrayed as this little boy that was dying. And then he sang. He opened for Celine Dion. Uh, he had a he had a tour. He uh, put out an album and uh, came out with a book. And the joke was just like after five six years, I was like, why isn't he dead yet? Wasn't he supposed to die? That was basically the idea behind the joke. And um, uh, he had never heard the joke because I only did this joke in theaters. Uh, but a journalist talked about the joke in an interview I was doing, and when the family heard about it, they called the Human Rights Commission. Uh, they sent me a bill for $80,000 telling me I had to give um, money to the, the, the child, money to his mother and to his stepfather. So I, I got a lawyer, and I told him I want to fight this, and he said, okay, but you're going to lose, because they didn't bring me to court court. They brought me to... Um, it was the Human Rights Tribunal. So it was the Human Rights Commission uh, bringing me to the Human Rights Tribunal. So the same people bringing me to court were the ones judging me. So he said, you're going to lose, but then we can appeal it, and you're probably going to win that. So we did appeal, and I lost uh, in the appellate court, and then we brought it to the Supreme Court. And uh, after, after like 10 years uh, this week, I won. But it's been 10 years. It would have been so much easier to just... You know, pay, but I thought it was I thought it was stupid to you can't have a government organization telling you what you can and can't do or can and can't say. I mean, it's fascinating to me. Now, you, you just related the joke and it's not even in the comedy club context, but you related it. The audience here laughed at it. And the reason is that it's okay. not the, <laughs> is it, and not because the audience here want a child to die. And you obviously don't want a child to die. It's not no. real. And part of the joke, of course, is how inappropriate that is to make, you know, wait, I, I'm, I'm explaining something you already know. Um, but is it, yeah. is it quite <laughs> shocking to you the way in which people have this literal minded interpretation of what a comedian does, particularly a comedian like you, who is known for pushing the boundaries? from time to time. Yeah, the thing I find that's really weird is people treat this like, like I was doing this joke uh, at the kid's house, like I was going to his house every night. And because uh, in a lot of articles, they said Mike Ward did this joke 200 and I don't know how many times, however many shows I did in my tour. But uh, he had never like the, the joke. I, I didn't go to this kid's house. I, I don't even do television here in Canada. So the only way you could hear that joke is if you p paid to see me. And that's what I find that's so peculiar with, uh, like dark comedy, uh, the type of comedy I do, uh, half, uh, the, half the audience likes it. Well, my audience likes it, but I mean, half of uh, regular people like it, half hate it. But the beauty is people that hate it, you, you don't have to come see me. Like if you're offended by my jokes, stay home. It's so simple. Same thing as like now what Chappelle's going through with the trans material. If you find Chappelle offensive, don't watch his special. Don't when he comes to your town, don't pay to see him. It's, like it's that, not that complicated. It sounds so easy when you say it like that. Clearly, it's, yeah. clearly it's not. Clearly, <laughs> these people are being forced into their chairs with their eyes clamped open and they have to watch exactly they don't want to see. Um, do you think this is a, a, a growing problem? I mean, I saw your show when you came over to the Edinburgh Fringe. I mean, that must have been about five years ago now. And I saw your show. Yeah. We were talking about this the back then. And this has been a long, long, long process. I mean, uh, uh, you must be utterly relieved that this is over by now. And do you think things have gotten yeah. worse yeah. since you did this before? I think uh, things had gotten worse, and uh, the thing I was really worried about, I'm happy that I won at the Supreme Court level, because I didn't want to create a precedent, and I didn't want, uh, you know, people to then be able to bring you to court in, uh, uh, in England because you made fun of a group, and then they'd use me as sort of, you know, a uh, precedent. But uh, I think now with my verdict, um, it, it's a... I think comedy is going to come back. I feel like when I'm doing shows, people that like dark humor are fed up with uh, uh, the cancel culture and all the, the crap 
that goes with it. And I think the fact that Chappelle isn't, you know, he's, he's not standing like he's, he's keep he's fighting still the fact that I won. I think it's good for comedians everywhere. We don't have a similar situation here insofar as we don't have people who have been taken to court and fined many, many thousands of pounds. It feels from our perspective like Canada is, is, is in a very weird place at the moment that it's, when it comes to free speech that you guys are not getting it right. Is that a fair comment? No, that is a, uh, exactly a fair comment. Our, our leader here, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, the, the day, the first uh, um, day, the, the, my first verdict when it came out, he did a speech saying how uh, in the old days we used to say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And he said that simply isn't true. And then he started talking about bullying. And it, it was just, I was like, okay, this is, this is crazy. This is crazy that the leader of my country is saying that words hurt more than actions. And I'm a comic that does shows in, in clubs and in theaters. He's the leader of a supposedly free nation. And every other picture of him is him in blackface. So, but I'm the problem. Well, this is true. This is true. Sometimes yeah. I see those pictures, and he did say in an interview, he wasn't sure how many pictures there were out there. He's clearly done this an <laughs> awful lot, you know? So That's like crazy this. when you don't know how many. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, has this affected you in any way in terms of what you write and what you perform? Is there a, a, a sort of nagging thing at the back of your head thinking, oh, maybe I better, better tone this down a little bit? It, it did at first, but since this has been going on for like 10 years, uh, the first couple of years, I was afraid I was going to censor myself too much. So I didn't write for a couple of years. And now um, it, it hasn't changed me. And you can't let something like this change you. I, I was hoping and, and I was afraid I'd go too hard just to sort of like a, as a, you know, a F you to the government and I, or that I just cave and become, you know, a pale pale version of what I used to be. And I just stayed who, who I was and I stayed who I am. And I'm happy about that. I think people might say, though, because you're so established and so well known, uh, that in a sense, it's, that's, that's an easier prospect for you. But younger comedians who are coming up through the circuit, they see this stuff, like what happened to you, what happened to Chappelle, and they're yeah. thinking, it's not worth it. And maybe there are some young comedians who are just naturally instinctively subversive, and they want to do those kinds of, that kind of material, but they'll shy away. And, and we'll all lose out, won't we, when, if that happens? Yeah, yeah, definitely. They have to, you have to follow your heart. If you're a comedian and you like dark comedy, you should do dark comedy and you shouldn't let people that aren't in the audience bully you into stop doing what you're doing. You, you, we, we have to remember when you're doing, and you know this, like you do comedy for the people in front of you. So we have to stop listening to what someone that's never seen your show, never even heard of you before a joke uh, was in the paper, what they think. They don't matter. And are you optimistic for the future? Because I always think every now and then when, when you know, someone like Chappelle stands up and takes a, takes a stand against them, and when you win this case, I think, OK, the tide is turning, it's pushing in this way. Uh, but then everyone tells me I'm wrong, and actually, ultimately, we're going to lose this one. Where do you think the future lies for comedy? I'm a glass-half-full guy, so I think, I think it's going to come back. I think eventually people are going to admit that Hannah Gatsby was never funny, and uh, comedy is going to come back. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.